birthday party. Oh, I, I, I just need to sign an email, but Bear called me a few days ago. I guess it was Friday, Thursday, Friday. He called me. Oh, okay. Uh, but I, I'll just don't know. It's nothing, nothing sensitive, but I'll. Uh, he called me. He said they'd been cooking down the sap. Hey, how are y'all? Hello. You doing okay, Jeremy? Doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I hope I'm doing all right anyway. We'll see. We're glad to have you. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be asked to do anything. These have been such good sessions, and informative and all, so. Definitely. We, so we've enjoyed you. it. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Hello to the Bowles family. Good to see you all there. Hi. Hey guys, sorry about that. No Nicole, problem. Or, uh, Nanette was telling me that uh, she went, she had a, a doctor's appointment, you know, one of those phone consultation deals today. And mm -hmm. uh, that he told her that if you get tested, uh, you have to quarantine uh, for two weeks or until you get the results back. 
So they were saying not to be tested uh, until Friday, and they usually take 48 hours to get your results back. So if you get tested on a Friday, you should know by Monday. <laughs> but you have to quarantine all weekend. So doesn't that sound like great fun? So just don't get tested, huh? Or just don't get tested. Well, I'm curious to be tested because I want to know if I've got the antibodies. If I've got the antibodies, then I ain't going to worry about it. I'm going to go do whatever I want to do. Right. May even donate plasma or something. You were on the phone. We thought you might have been on the phone with Mr. Douglas. <laughs> uh -huh. No, Oliver Wendell. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, I was talking to the guy that was up the telephone pole. <laughs> Which one was that? That was Douglas, wasn't it? Yeah, Oliver Wendell Douglas. Olive all. All I can remember is Darling. Darling, that was the only name I could remember him by. Yeah. <laughs> ja Zsa Gabor. Yeah. I've got everything scheduled up through the 18th. I was working on the farm pond management when that phone call came in. So I just like, uh, those three getting all of the uh, Zoom scheduled through. Did Did you see my email concerning uh, the one on the? Mm, I don't remember the one you had down for Phil. The one where he's doing the home weather stations on the twelfth. Phil, did you already have one? I don't. And, and in fact, I messaged him today. I haven't heard back as, as to whether I'm assuming there shouldn't be any problem with him. Um, being able to do the Zoom session for that, but uh, so that one is questionable. The the one on the twelfth uh, is not confirmed yet. Right. Okay. Well, um, Bonnie, and, and, did she? You, you said she responded, right, Jeremy? Yeah, Bonnie, Bonnie, Scott, and Bill are good to go. And so is Nicole and John. Um, the farm pond is good to go. I heard back from the guys at uh, Virginia State. They're, they're fine doing the, the farm pond session. Okay. Well, Jeremy, what was the one that we talked about after the fact that we said that the greens, the... Uh, um, oh, Martha Yaunt. Having Martha Yaunt to do something. Phil, what do you think about trying to maybe squeeze her in on that Friday the 22nd or um, the 15th or one of the Fridays so that we can catch her when the greens are at their peak? She was going wait, to be like a minute there. My email was I found out today they're they're working on developing that. They've not done anything with it yet. Right. But we could probably have her go ahead and present. And I, and I don't know if it's much as her or Sean Wright on that? I'd rather have Martha teach it than Sean. Right. No. You might contact her to see where she's, where she's at on that. And I just know they were developing a publication. And from and what the, I way, the other night when we were doing this and uh, Merle couldn't get in, it didn't pop up on my screen. It and didn't pop up on mine either. So he got offended that he couldn't get in, and he, he was pretty testy when he got a hold of me. And um, I, I just wanted you all to know that if it pops up and I don't see it, um, which if it didn't show on yours, it didn't show on mine, I'm assuming it was just a glitch. No, I, mean, I was all over it that night. Okay. Of everything uh, was happening. Chris and I were both able to come right in tonight, so the, I don't know if the waiting room was even – I had, just had to let Joyce in. Uh, so I don't know why it's requesting admission for some and not for everybody. No, it, it's it's for everybody now. I turned it on after Chris and Phil got in. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Joyce, count yourself lucky, honey. He was trying to keep the riffraff out, and you just don't know <laughs> who he's going to veto. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, he missed me. I guess I better go back out and wait. I, actually, your name come up and I admitted you. Well, I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you. Good, good to see you. And Chris, good to see you again. I'm looking forward to this one. Well, thank you. I had seen the butterfly talk, but I've not seen the dragonflies and damselflies, so. 
Did you ever get a response on that black and white butterfly feel? Uh, yes, he did respond, and I never did send it on. I don't think I sent it to you. I think I tried to send it to both of you. Oh, okay. It's um. So it's you a probably moth. got it, Chad. Yeah. It's a moth. Yeah, it's a. It's one of two possibilities because there are two that are so similar. They're both uh, grapevine leaf folders because the caterpillars will feed on, on grape and fold the leaf. Um, and the only way you can be for, for sure which one of the two it is, is to look at the underneath of their abdomen uh, for some markings. Uh, of course, your picture didn't, wasn't able to show that, but uh, it's probably the grapevine the first one that I live. But I think I sent an email, I, I, cause Phil had forwarded from yours and I took the email uh, that was listed there. Uh, uh, Chad, uh, I don't know, it was Chad something Baker at whatever and uh, uh, added that to my reply back to Phil. Okay, it's possible that it's been lost in the email blizzard. Uh, that can easily happen. It's gotten worse. I don't know if it's like this at Mountain Empire, but since this whole COVID thing started and everything's distance uh, and electronic, there are so many emails. It was already bad since this thing started. I can't even keep one day cleared out, let alone catch up on all the ones that were backlogged from the previous. I'm just I'm glad just I'm retired now from Mountain Empire not having to deal with I, I taught a lot of online classes, but to have all your classes online and try to deal with uh, how they were finishing up the semester, uh, I retired uh, uh, at a good time uh, a couple of years ago. So, Well, I hope that your retirement's not in some state retirement thing that is on the verge of going belly up like Kentucky's pension system. <laughs> Uh, I haven't heard anything, but it's it's obviously a concern, but I, I'm hoping the Virginia system is pretty well uh, vested right now. We'll see. Our state retirement before this COVID thing started, uh, it was 16% funded. Oh. So uh, we know that it's probably right at the breaking point uh, after all of this. I think Virginia is in, in a lot better shape than that. I, at least I hope so. We like to raid the pension system over here to uh, pave roads and buy votes. Uh. <laughs> hey, Phil, you know what impresses me is that you and Chris decorated your all's houses the same way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> Birds of a feather. <laughs> you do know we're at the extension office. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, my Wi-Fi is temperamental, and I don't want to risk. Uh, some days it runs just fine, and then other times it'll just shut off for no reason. So uh, I'm going to get a new provider, but that's that's for the future. Well, I have, uh, according to the atomic clock, I have six oh one. Is uh, if you're ready to go, Chris, I'll yeah, introduce I think you. So. All right. Well, uh, thanks uh, again for everybody tuning in, and once again, we're we're lucky to have uh, Chris Allgaier with us. He's the president of the Virginia Master Naturalist High Knob Chapter uh, that meets here in Wise County, and uh, he's you might have saw his presentation on butterflies of the southern appalachians and tonight his presentation is on dragonflies and damselflies so chris i'll give it to you all righty thank you uh dragonflies and damselflies has been is a fairly new topic for me to research and study i've spent a, almost all my life with butterflies and i was thinking you know why haven't i paid more attention to the dragonflies because they're really cool and I'm thinking it might come from my early childhood uh, this is going to show up backwards on your screen I think because the camera here but this golden guide of insects I wore out at least two of these uh, as, as a kid and all uh, was one of my favorite books of trying to learn about insects and I was looking through here and dragonflies and damselflies have a total of two pages. That's it. 
in, in this book. And then you turn to the butterfly section and there are over 40 pages of butterflies, uh, just page after page of butterflies and moths, uh, the area of Lepidoptera. And so I'm thinking this is probably what got me more interested in trying to learn about butterflies and moths because there were just so many of them as a young uh, kid. I was thinking, wow, look, look at all those. Not realizing that this little page of two different uh, uh, dragonflies that we have and damselflies, there are hundreds in, in, uh, of those around, but um, I didn't know about it until uh, kind of recently in terms of, of learning about insects and all. So that's kind of background on, on this. Um, I'm not as well versed in uh, trying to share my screen here. Um, host dis uh, says host disabled participant screen sharing. So someone's going to have to activate that allow me to share a screen. I fixed it. Okay. Let me try it again here. Share screen. Okay. There we go. And share. Okay, and let me start the start the slideshow over here. Oh, this looks good up here. Darn, now that's okay. Slideshow from the beginning. Okay. Okay, everyone see the uh, slideshow? Okay, now. Got that there. I'm going to minimize this little box. We got you, Chris. Looking good. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeremy. All righty. So, uh, that little thing's coming up. You don't see that. I get. Do you see the ID number and a stop share on your screen? Uh, no. Okay. On your screen only. Okay. We're fine then. All righty. So, let's get started here. Um, just some um, general science for those of you that are interested in these things, the classification, we are talking about animals, phylum, arthropoda, the arthropods, many jointed creatures, uh, subphylum, hexapods, and then class, these are insects. So they have the three body parts for adults of head, thorax, abdomen, and uh, three pairs of legs, antennae and all. Uh, the order uh, for dragonflies and damselflies is odonata, and uh, they are divided into two suborders, the dragonflies and the damselflies. And one of our goals is to be able to identify and learn the difference uh, among these. Um, I did a little research on what folks might know about dragonflies and a lot of myths out there. I don't know if you've heard any of these or not. Uh, dragonflies supposedly will sew, sew your ears shut while you sleep, or I've seen the, the, they will sew your mouth shut. I guess that comes from the uh, group of dragonflies called darners, which people relate to a darning needle, maybe. Another myth, dragonfly stings are horrifically poisonous. Uh, myth number three, dragonflies are in league with the devil. Uh, myth four, dragonflies present, fish will not bite. I don't know if you've heard that or not, any fishmen in the group. And um, another myth, dragonflies represent supernatural beings and therefore should be left alone at all costs. So there are a lot of misinformation and uh, old wives tales and whatever about um, dragonflies and there may be more. This is just a few that uh, came up with. In reality, some facts about dragonflies. They don't sting. They don't even have stingers. They're not going to bite people unless you mess with them and they might in self-defense. They do have very sharp teeth, but they're going to use those to feed mainly on other insects. They are carnivores. They are fierce hunters. The adults can gr grab the prey with their feet. They fly around and like hawks and, and uh, capture their prey on the wing. Um, a good feature, they don't carry any diseases or germs. And one of the best things about dragonflies, I think you'll agree, is that dragonflies can eat hundreds of mosquitoes in a single day. Their flight patterns are amazing. They can hover, they can fly straight up and straight down, side to side, rapid movements, all amazing flight patterns. Uh, I think uh, people in aeronautics are trying to figure out how they do some of the things they do. And they have the best eyesight of any insect. Their compound eyes make up most of their heads and they can see in almost every direction except 
right behind them. So if you're trying to stalk a dragonfly, that's one key feature to know that if you can stay directly behind them, they're less likely to notice your presence. They have amazing eyesight. Uh, they can see colors that we can't see um, and all into the ultraviolet range uh, as and also uh, their, their eyes again are, are exceptional. Ancient dragonflies from fossil records, there were some things flying around that were two feet across. That would be kind of scary, I think, to, to uh, see something that size coming at you, especially as they are carnivorous. Uh, here's a simple drawing that we use for the uh, um, programs with children, uh, looking at a dragonfly. The head, uh, you see the huge eyes make up almost all the head. Uh, they have the legs, of course, the thorax, the middle section, the thorax, the, the legs are attached, the wings are attached, and then they have the, the abdomen and two pairs of wings for uh, both dragonflies and damselflies. A little more technical drawing, and I'm going to go into all of this. We won't have a quiz tonight, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, but looking at comparison, on the left, you see the dragonflies. Uh, they're generally larger than damselflies. Um, they um, look at the eyes and in, in the picture there, uh, they have mandibles and things. That, not only do they have the huge compound eyes, which I think as many as 30,000 simple eyes are in the compound eye, uh, they also have three smaller, many insects have these ocelli, which are uh, type of little single cell eyes that that uh, are single eyes that they might have and all. Um, the damselfly, you notice on the right, uh, the eyes are more separated apart uh, on their head. That's one of the ways to identify. They also are much more slender. And one of the key features is how they fold their wings, or at least most of the time. Um, dragonflies will uh, have their wings outstretched at rest, um, perpendicular to the body, uh, damselflies will fold their wings along parallel to their uh, abdomen, and that is uh, a feature to help you uh, do the identification. Um, if you really get into dragonfly anatomy, which I'm trying to do, I've been spending the last three years or so really trying to learn more and more about them. One of the things in identification uh, are to um, uh, know the terminal appendages of both males and females. They are different. Uh, they also show a larva there. We'll talk about life cycle in a little bit. The larva uh, live in water uh, and they have their uh, 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 things as well. But each species, they have unique terminal appendages in male and females and also the male genitalia are unique as well. Uh, and uh, sometimes the only way you can identify a species is to get under a magnifying glass and look and examine some of the differences uh, in their uh, terminal appendages. Males have two upper appendages and one lower. So they have, uh, and these are used to clasp the female by the head during mating. We'll see some pictures in a little bit. Female terminal appendages only have two uh, top appendages um, in a segment. Before that, you see they have a separate device of an ovipositor. Um, and also, uh, some of the guidebooks that I have, and I'll show one later on, have pages and pages of just pictures of the terminal appendages to help try to ID. I found that identification of dragonflies is a lot tougher than butterflies, a whole lot more difficult. And there, there's some that, um, as I show some of the slides today, I'm thinking this is probably what it is, but I'm not always exactly certain. On, on some of these. Uh, life cycle, they have an amazing life cycle. Uh, it's not a complete metamorphosis, it's an incomplete, but they start out as eggs. Females will drop eggs uh, that will land in the water eventually. Some of them uh, are laid on plants and then when they, the larva hatches, it drops into the water. The larva, the main life stage, lives underwater anywhere from three months to five years. Uh, usually on average, maybe two to three years. They are predatory in the water. They'll be gobbling up anything they can catch, uh, including maybe even as they get larger, maybe small minnows. Uh, they'll eat a lot of insects. Uh, your your uh, mosquito larvae that are in the water 
the, are a great food source for the uh, larva or nymphs of the uh, dragonflies. Once they, they'll shed their skins up to 18 times as they grow, and eventually they get large enough, they'll climb up out of the water, uh, shed that final skin, crawl out of that, and expand wings. It'll take several hours to dry the wings and uh, maybe a few days before all the colors come true. And then they'll become the adults that will fly around. They can live from uh, anywhere from a week to maybe eight weeks as adults. Uh, the mating is um, very interesting. It takes place in what's called a wheel formation. The male will clasp the female behind the head. If she's receptive, then she'll bring her abdomen up to meet him and uh, they'll mate sometimes in the air, they'll mate uh, landed. I've got a few pictures there of uh, mating that, that will see the, uh, the wheel formation that they uh, are known for. Uh, here's a simpler little version of life cycle, again showing starts with egg, uh, then the underwater nymphs, they grow, 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 then they crawl out and break out of that last little skin and become an adult, uh, either dragonfly or damselfly. So let's uh, start with damselflies tonight. Um, they are smaller in general than dragonflies, slimmer bodies, and most of them, again, fold the wings along the body when at rest. Uh, they've been around a long, long time. They're on every continent except Antarctica. Here in the North America, there are about 135 species uh, and uh, 3,000 worldwide. And the amazing thing, they come in all colors and uh, uh, varieties and all. This is one of the larger ones and one that's fairly easy to identify. We see these a lot around our region, the ebony jewel wing. Uh, their uh, abdomen often will uh, refract light, uh, kind of like some of the blue butterflies that we see. The wings are dark and black, the ebony part of it. Um, this is perched, I think this is at the uh, along the South Fork of the Powell River, Big Stone Gap along the Greenbelt Bound. This is a male. Um, sometimes it's difficult to tell uh, gender, uh, but some of them, their markings are often different. And uh, on the jewel wings, there are several different types of jewel wings, but uh, the jewel wings have a pretty distinct way of, of identifying male and female. So there's a male. Here is a female. Uh, this one came to our yard for some reason, landed on a butterfly bush, a budlia, a couple years ago. And um, she's not as colorful, and there's probably a reason for that, in that females usually want to uh, uh, stay uh, uh, inconspicuous a lot of times. Uh, but notice the tips of her wings, those white markings. That identifies her as a female ebony jewel wing. Uh, here's a close-up of a male that's uh, flexing out his wings. Sometimes when they're uh, perched, they will flutter their wings a little bit, and I happen to catch one there uh, with his wings uh, fluttering around. So there is, um, as I start seeing them, uh, well, uh, we might see them uh, pretty soon now. They start out in May, and then we see a couple generations uh, throughout the summer and they'll fly through woods along trails. They don't have to be right on the water. They'll venture uh, a distance away from the water sometimes uh, as they're flying around and, and tickers are looking for food to uh, snare and eat. Um, there's a group of damselflies known as dancers. And the males are usually pretty easy to distinguish. Most of them, at least that I've found around here, the females, again, more drably. I'm not always able to ID them as well. Uh, this is a blue fronted dancer. Um, they kind of stay close to the ground and fly, uh, uh, dance around as they fly. I guess that's where they got that particular name uh, for this group. Uh, here's one that's on pavement. I find them a lot along the uh, green belt uh, resting the pavement, particularly in, in the sunny parts of the pavement. And, and the males seem to be, uh, you know, uh, on the prowl as it would. Uh, if you look carefully at this one, at his mouth, there's something in it. I didn't realize when I was taking the picture, but later on, it's caught some kind of critter, and I have no idea what it is, but it's munching uh, on uh, uh, some poor uh, thing that it uh, captured and uh, is having a little meal there. Uh, if you look at the uh, 
forelegs, you can see the barbs on their legs are useful in terms of capturing and capturing things. These little guys will feed on, on aphids and things. They, they catch a lot of things. Uh, not always in the air. They might take things off plants as well. Um, in searching for dragonflies and damselflies, it's a motion that you see a lot of times. Out in the woods, I saw something litter by and land in this general area. And so I tried to take a picture uh, thinking, oh, there's something in there. Um, how many you can spot uh, the, uh, uh, there's a damselfly in that picture. And um, it's down in the lower center. I'll move my mouse around it here. Uh, there she is. And this, I didn't know what it was. I've, I've sent it to a Facebook group to help ID it. And turns out this is another blue fronted dancer, but she's not as blue because it's a female and the colors are more subdued and muted. Uh, seems like uh, in this particular species, there's a close up of her. Uh, here's a dancer I like to find is pretty, the males in particular are pretty easy to ID, a uh, variable dancer. Uh, they used to call this a violet dancer and then they renamed them a few years ago. And now it's known as a variable dancer. Uh, not all males have this coloration. Uh, but most of them do. Uh, this is a natural tunnel park. Uh, this is another one along the green belt. Uh, they seem to show up around the same time of year. Usually uh, uh, June, July is when I'm seeing these most often uh, around, uh, around our area. And here's a close up of one kind of showing the uh, uh, hairiness of this dude. Didn't realize that they were that hairy until you get up close to look at them. See the compound eye and the segment. Um, where its abdomen starts, that's where the reproductive organs are in the males. Um, and uh, you'd think it'd be at the tip of the abdomen, but no, their reproductive organs are there uh, in that uh, segment, just past that second segment uh, from, the, uh, from the thorax there, right in uh, that little area there. Uh, other dancers, there's a powdered dancer. Uh, has a powdery uh, a whitish look to it. Uh, there's another powdered dancer uh, picture it's able to get. These things are not that big. You can see they're, they're uh, maybe a couple inches in length, real slender bodies. And uh, they spook very easily because again, that great eyesight, they're hard to sneak up on. Some of them will stay posed for a while. A lot of them you, you get anywhere, start to take picture and away they go and fly. Um, Bluettes are a troubling group for me to try to figure out what they are. I think I got an ID from a, uh, a site that this is a slender bluette. Uh, I wasn't sure about it. This is off in a distance. I had to zoom in uh, above the pond at Mountain Empire College and all. Um, here's a slender bluette. Um, another one that I had to get help with to ID. This one I was able to ID on my own because of the double stripe on the thorax there, uh, double stripe blue X right here is a little thin second stripe below that. And so that made that uh, a pretty clear one to, to ID. Um, and here's a mating pair. Uh, I couldn't get a better angle on this, uh, but it's the best I could get of the wheel. Uh, the male is the upper uh, fellow there. His abdomen comes around and those the claspers have clasped the head of the female and then she bends her abdomen back around uh, to the male's um, sexual organs there and that's where the mating is, is taking place uh, on that. And, and from the side you would see more of the wheel uh, formation there. I'm pretty sure this these are turquoise bluettes. I'm not 100% certain but a key feature is on the head here, you have a shape that looks kind of like a barbell, uh, the two blue ends and, and it's connected through across there. And that was why I'm thinking uh, those were tur turquoise bluettes. Here's one that Shad took a picture of and uh, sent it to Phil and Phil sent it to me uh, to uh, look at. It's a beautiful picture of an azure bluette. Uh, great colorations on that. You can see why they are known as bluettes and uh, uh, lovely male there in that picture. Uh, here is a great picture of a mating wheel. I was really lucky to get this. I saw something fly. Uh, I was really hunting butterflies at the time, but I saw this thing kind of in 
peripheral vision, uh, land in the grass, very small little things of aurora damsels, the uh, yellow markings on both the female who's down below and the male on his underneath his thorax. You see a little yellow there. Uh, that and that's one of the uh, more easy uh, damselflies to uh, do. And uh, they didn't stay there very long. I snapped basically one picture and I was trying to get another picture and they spotted me and, and flew deeper in the woods and I couldn't track them down. But uh, I was really happy to see that, uh, uh, get that particular shot of the uh, mating wheel. Um, fork tails are some of the smallest damselflies. They're one, and also some of the earliest ones to come out in the spring. These guys are probably out and about now. Uh, I haven't been uh, going to some of my usual places much, been so rainy so often uh, and cool, but uh, a fragile fork tail has a neat identifier on its thorax. Looks like an exclamation point. Uh, here's one I netted and uh, took a close up of, and you can see the two exclamation points on the thorax. Uh, that's an unmistakable uh, ID characteristic of what's known as a fragile fork tail. And they are tiny and uh, wispy as they fly around uh, through the air. You know, I was tried to be as gentle as I could with this one. It was able to fly away, so I didn't harm it in the taking of this uh, photo. Uh, other fork tails, uh, there's an eastern fork tail. Uh, again, a very, some of the very smaller damselflies. And this is one of the earlier pictures that I took, maybe about six or six years ago or so, uh, up in the pound area uh, of a citrine fork tail. That's on a little blade of grass, very tiny little thing. I saw it early in the morning and uh, it, was, it was staying real low to the ground. And I had to sneak up on that. It probably took me 10 minutes before I, it let me get at least close enough uh, to get a picture of that. Uh, uh, little fella. It is a male. Uh, the colorations uh, on that uh, help identify this, this particular little fork tail. There are lots of other uh, um, damselflies around and like happens so many times in nature, there, there are uh, uh, changes to your basic rules. We said the damselflies usually fold their wings uh, uh, over their abdomen, um, parallel to their to their abdomen, but there are uh, several uh, damselflies known as spread wing damselflies, and this these I found up at Mountain Empire a couple years ago. A spotted spread wing. Uh, here's a close up of it. The spot you can barely see on this, but it's on the lower abdomen, uh, right under here is where the spotted markings are on this particular species. It, uh, I, again, I think I got a uh, Facebook uh, expert ID to verify that I was correct on, on this one. Um, there's another one there uh, uh, perched on a little uh, blade of grass. Again, they're not real, real big uh, flying around. And I was able to photograph some pairs of them. At first, I thought they were mating. And then I looked more closely and said, no, they're not forming the wheel. The male on top has grasped the female but she's not bringing her abdomen down around up to uh, the male part. They've already mated and she is laying her eggs and the male is guarding her uh, and staying with her probably to prevent other males from coming in. Uh, and um, uh, she, this particular species, rather than lay their eggs in the water, they lay their eggs and insert them in the plants. And then uh, this, these are plants that are out over the pond and the, uh, larvae when they hatch, the nymphs when they hatch will then drop into the water. Uh, here's another picture. This is way far out. I had to zoom as best I could, try to hold the camera steady, and uh, got uh, a pretty good shot of uh, this pair of spotted uh, damselflies, uh, spread wing damselflies, and the female underneath is doing her ovipositing. Uh, one other spread wing, I uh, found this up at Harrisonburg at the Master Naturalist uh, uh, meeting last year um, and um, took a while. I'm pretty sure the idea, I'm not 100%, but I think based upon the, the uh, male uh, claspers at the end and the looks of those and going through my, my keys and all that this is an amber wing spread wing. Uh, this is one of the larger spread wing uh, damselflies that you might see and uh, 
again, uh, the, the uh, characteristics of the separated eyeballs and everything that it has, uh, uh, they're, they're nifty little things flying around. Okay, dragonflies. Dragonflies have large multifaceted eyes, two pair strong wings, and those wings are usually held outstretched horizontally when they are at rest. Uh, like damselflies, the male will have the three terminal appendages on the abdomen, female only has two. Uh, 325 species in North America. Uh, again, my little insect book only had two pages uh, to uh, show them, and over 3,000 species worldwide. Um, just about in numbers in Virginia, according to a Facebook site that I follow, uh, they keep a running total of species identified in Virginia uh, on that site, and they're getting over 120 uh, different species of Odonata, dragonflies and damselflies combined throughout Virginia. Not all of those are found in our end of the state, uh, but uh, there are a lot of them. I'm just getting started on trying to find some of these. Uh, shared a picture by Shad a while ago. Here's a picture by Phil Meeks uh, that he sent me from his homestead up in Pound. Uh, this is one of the oldest genuses of dragonflies called a gray petal tail. And uh, they have a unique uh, way of per or perching like this. This is their particular style of perching. They like to wood surfaces, poles. They also like to land on people. I think Phil told me this one first landed on him. Uh, startling a little bit, and then uh, it uh, came and landed on this uh, uh, wooden uh, structure and all. So that's a great petal tail. I've seen a few of them. I've not been fortunate enough to get a photo, though, of one. So I'm still looking for my own first photo of a gray petal tail. Uh, notice the uh, uh, wing formation there outstretched. Uh, dragonflies in particular come in uh, different categories. They're the ones that like to perch. They're also ones that, that rarely ever perch, and uh, they basically hunt by flying around almost constantly, and they're different uh, perching styles as well. Um, this particular uh, dragonfly, about this time of year, what, three years ago, I guess, uh, found this on Stock Creek at uh, Natural Tunnel, and um, happened to see it because it was really well camouflaged. This is a newly emerged uh, I didn't know what it was at the time. I sent it to a site and they identified it as a twin spotted spike tail. Uh, now I think I can recognize this particular species when I see it. Um, but it's, the word there is called teneral. When an insect has just come out of its exoskeleton uh, and it's drying off, the term they use is they are teneral. And one of the things that make identification of dragonflies uh, and damselflies difficult is that they change colors as they age. Uh, their eye colors will change, their abdomen colors will sometimes change. Uh, and so a teneral species hasn't taken on its true colors yet, particularly in the eyes and others. If you look real carefully, you see the exuvia or exoskeleton of the nymph that is crawled out with. It's pretty well camouflaged on this tree bark, but you can see the legs, here's the head, of the uh, nymph that came out of the water. Uh, and this was probably about maybe 10 feet. It had to cross the trail from where the creek was. It crawled quite a distance out of the water uh, and then found this tree and crawled up. And this was uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning. I, I came acro across this uh, particular uh, event happening. Now notice its wings are not uh, opened out yet. They'll stay like this. It's drying its wings, and this will take several hours uh, to do. Here's another view uh, of it uh, hanging there. Uh, as this, and they are quite vulnerable at this time. Uh, fortunately, uh, I wasn't going to harm it. Uh, but uh, during this time, they really can't defend themselves as they're trying to dry out their wings. And if something came along, uh, if a bird spotted them, for example, that would be uh, curtains for the for the poor fella here. Here's a close-up of him. Uh, as he dried out. Couldn't stay the whole time, but uh, hopefully he made uh, 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 his transition well and uh, flew off maybe a few hours later. You know, uh, while we're talking about the exoskeleton, the term in, for insects of an exoskeleton's left behind is exuvia. 
And if you see these along reeds and along uh, uh, water sources, uh, these are dragonfly exuvia. Here's one that uh, is uh, attached there and uh, found a tree a couple years ago up at High Knob uh, Recreation Area along the lake there. One tree had uh, dozens of these one year. I think these are darners of some type. Uh, there's a whole Facebook group that uh, just works on trying to identify and uh, uh, takes pictures of exuvia. I'm not involved in that one, but uh, that's a little too uh, uh, complicated for me. But there are experts there that can identify uh, a species often by looking at the uh, exuvia that remains from them. Uh, we talked about the myth of uh, dragonflies uh, sewing your ears together and all. There's a whole group of large dragonflies known as darners. The most common one uh, is the common green darner. Uh, these made the news last year because they uh, they migrate twice a year. They, they, they migrate south in the fall and then in smaller groups they'll migrate. The, the, the same ones will migrate but their offspring will migrate up the, the coast uh, in the spring. And um, the darners I guess get their name because the abdomen maybe looks like a knitting needle of some kind. Uh, they also have huge eyes that almost look like they grow together. Uh, this one was trapped uh, in Brian Hubbard's uh, blueberry uh, netting uh, they put over there so when we were up there one time and uh, didn't have a net with me, but I was able to use a hat and jump up a few times. Eventually we rescued this, this guy and let it get out. I don't know how it got in the netting in the first place, but uh, uh, we got it out of there. Uh, lovely uh, uh, dragonfly. Here is one I found last uh, summer at Mountain Empire. This is a female and she is ovipositing. Uh, she's laying some eggs in along the, the uh, edge of the pond up there. And uh, that's pretty neat to see. Uh, notice the big brown eyes that she has. And then this marking almost like a little bullseye thing. That's the characteristic identifier of, of the uh, green darner, that uh, kind of uh, middle eye spot is what it looks like there. Uh, to help identify her. But that was kind of neat to see as she was going along and just dropping her eggs uh, in the water there. Uh, up at High Knob in the fall, we see a lot of shadow darners uh, flying around. They were all over the place during the naturalist rallies. Uh, this is one that uh, Josephine Rodriguez and her students were up there a few years ago. They were doing a study of dragonflies. They did some really nice research at UVA Wise on um, Odonata. And uh, this is one that they uh, netted that day to capture. And then last fall, um, I was lucky enough, these darners rarely, rarely land. They are really tough to get photos of because they, they hardly ever uh, will stop and perch. They just kind of cruise around and uh, hunt. Uh, and uh, you rarely can get pictures of them landed. But here is a male shadow darner. Uh, that we found up at the uh, High Knob. It's pretty neat. I got some good photos of it um, that particular day. Here's a close-up, uh, very intricate. The, the patterns of the wings, I think, are fascinating, and the, the colorations uh, that they have. Uh, There's incredible highs, again, that uh, they have, and the legs that, that clasp things and all. Um, years ago, before I really got big time into dragonflies, I had this visitor in our yard. Um, and I had no idea what it was, but I was able to look up the side. Look at the length of those legs on that dude. This is a dragon hunter. And we talk about dragonflies, they are carnivorous. They will feed on whatever they can catch. They eat a lot of mosquitoes. They eat a lot of small gnats and flying things that they catch in the air. But they will also catch other dragonflies if they can. They'll catch butterflies. They'll catch anything that they can grab onto as they're flying through the air. So they just swoop in and grab them with those long legs. And this particular uh, one is one of our largest dragonflies that we have in our region and it's aptly named Dragon Hunter because uh, they, they will uh, uh, feast on other smaller dragonflies that they can catch. Uh, I didn't know at the time when I took these pictures, but look at the tip of the wing up in the right corner. Uh, I'm not sure that's not, not in focus because I was focusing on the main uh, body of the uh, dragon hunter there, but that's either a dance fly or a robber fly. <laughs> For some reason, it's, it's a, 
on the uh, tip of the wing of, of that guy. Uh, so that's kind of uh, funny, but which, fly, which species of fly, I really can't tell for certain on that. Uh, here's a dragon hunter we found uh, when we did the junior naturalist at Natural Tunnel State Park. I was doing a program on dragonflies and we went down to Stock Creek then, I took my net and we went down to see what we could find. We can usually find uh, uh, a few damselflies and a few things. And there is this huge, uh, uh, probably fairly newly emerged dragon hunter up in a tree there. And it was fantastic there. I was able to net it and get, uh, there you can get an idea of the huge size of these dudes you know, and uh, it was perfect timing for the uh, program that I was doing with the uh, uh, junior naturalists there at Natural Tunnel and all. Um, another Natural Tunnel activity that we did was uh, to uh, do uh, uh, stream macroinvertebrates. Um, and um, we did, um, we captured a lot of different things. We got dobs and flies and all kinds of things. And this, I'm pretty sure, not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure is the nymph of a dragon hunter. It's, it's still not fully grown. It's probably about half grown at this point. Uh, but I'm, uh, uh, from what pictures I've seen and other things, this is most likely uh, what the uh, nymph looks like when it's in the water there. Uh, uh, odd looking dude for sure. Um, other club tail dragonflies that uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, occasionally get a picture of from here and there. This is at uh, St. Paul, uh, a splendid club tail landed in front of me and stayed long enough that I could uh, snap in the picture. You can see the, uh, the thick and rear abdomen there of this male uh, of the uh, what, why they're called club tails. There are lots of species of club tails. I can't identify all of them yet. Uh, here's one that's probably a lancet club tail, but it might be an ashy club tail. This is up in Mountain Empire. And um, the identification of which one it is, is a very tricky. I've seen uh, posts on the uh, Facebook Odonata sites and often they'll just say, well, I can't really tell for sure from the picture. It's probably this, but I'm not sure. So I'm gonna, uh, say uh, until you, you, if you can catch one and maybe examine uh, the, uh, uh, the appendages uh, of them, you might be able to uh, identify which, uh, which of those two it happens to be. Um, here's a black shouldered spiny leg, uh, kind of got a sheen to it, a pretty thing. This is in our uh, herb bed, uh, came in one time. Uh, here is a black shouldered uh, spiny leg. Uh, another one, this was on the green belt that landed in front of me and again stayed long enough. Uh, I almost have to have a camera that can zoom in on a lot of these because again with their great eyesight, uh, any kind of movement they sense, uh, they'll, they'll dart off and fly away uh, before you can get a decent picture, but uh, this one turned out pretty good of uh, this pretty, pretty fellow. Um, saddlebags are some interesting uh, uh, species. There, we have several in our area. I've been able to get a picture of a couple of them. This is a black saddlebags from the side. You really can't get a sense of why they're called saddlebags until you look at the lower wings and you have these uh, black, in this case, black regions here in the lower wings. Most of the dragonflies we've seen so far haven't had many markings on their wings. We're gonna get a bunch of them now where their wings are uh, uh, often uh, quite marked, and the uh, the saddlebag uh, there is. Uh, I guess someone thought that was that looked like a, a saddlebag or something, and, and gave them that name. Uh, here is a Carolina saddlebags. Uh, this was just passing through. I don't think they've they've uh, they're uh, reproducing at Mountain Empire, but I I found one uh, last spring. It was out of distance and I was lucky to get a shot. And again, the uh, lower wings have the uh, distinctive markings there and they have the orangey colors to them, you know. One of the most common of the larger dragonflies that we'll see in there out and, out, out and about now, uh, this picture is taken at the Cedars uh, last year, but I've seen them uh, throughout our region, common whitetail. Um, and, um, Note the uh, interesting markings on the wings, and you get the idea of why it's called a white tail. 
the abdomen is white, but it didn't start out that way. Uh, that shows that this is a mature male. Uh, uh, Cruinosity is a term used for the graying of the body parts of dragonfly species, particularly the abdomens. And um, it's a feature of this. It's a very common dragonfly. We see them a lot around. Uh, they're easy to tell the male and female apart, at least once you, you get pictures of them. The females have different wing markings and they don't have the white tail. They don't get the cruinosity of the uh, uh, abdomen there. This is the uh, um, female. Again, this was at the Cedars uh, a few years ago. And here's another female. Uh, I guess this was last year I got this picture. Uh, similar place over at the Cedars in Lee County. Uh, beautiful uh, wing pictures. I think it's a striking uh, dragonfly. And they're pretty common and they will kind of perch a lot. They're not the flyers like the uh, darners are where you hardly ever find a darner in a, in a, uh, a perch position. Um, these um, white tails do like to perch on rocks, on branches, and if you're just patient and stay still, they might fly off, but then they'll come back again and usually let you get some photos and all. Here is a common white tail. Now you look at the wings, it's got the wing markings of the male, uh, but notice the abdomen looks like the female abdomen. I'll go back, here's the female. Uh, notice the wing markings, here's the male different wing markings, similar abdomen. Well, this is an immature female, it's, or an immature male, excuse me. It's very young and it hasn't developed the white tail yet. As it ages, the abdomen will become uh, pruneos and will uh, uh, lighten and become that white grayish uh, color. Uh, a similar dragonfly in terms of the black and white markings on the wings are the widow skimmers. This is a male widow skimmer. Um, skimmers are another dragonfly that often will perch and they'll watch as something flies by, they'll go after it real quick and then they'll come back to their perching site and rest there. Uh, so they don't, uh, they hunt uh, uh, in that style. Uh, this is a male, this is a female, um, no slightly different wing markings, it doesn't have the white that the uh, male had. And um, this one, unfortunately, I found it was it had deceased. I don't know why. This is up at UVA Wise Camp, and I found it on sidewalk. And uh, I don't know what what killed it or what what happened to it, but uh, uh, I was able to pose it and at least get a good uh, close-up picture of of her. A uh, few others that I've seen once in a while. This is my only picture that I got of a spangled skimmer. Uh, the spangles are the black and white little markings on the tip of the wings. Uh, that that they have. Uh, here's a banded pennant and this guy flew off. I got one picture and then it flew away and I never saw it again. Uh, wandering glider. This is up a mountain empire just just flying slowly over the grass in a sunny field and it land and I try to sneak up and get a picture and fly off but then come back and land Wandering gliders are kind of interesting. They, they, they get the term wandering because they kind of uh, migrate through different areas and, and all. Uh, very pretty uh, golden colors uh, on this uh, dragonfly. Uh, I've seen them uh, in Scott County. Again, this is a mountain empire. See them once in a while and they've got to be in the right place at the right time to find one that might land. Uh, this is early morning still and it was uh, maybe drinking some dew or whatever. I'm not sure, but it was uh, it did uh, stay close enough so I could able to get some pictures of it right on, right along the uh, the ground. Um, here's one of the pretty uh, dragonflies that I like. They come in all different colors, and this is one case where maybe the females are more brightly colored than the males, but they blend in very well because their coloration is green. These are eastern pond hawks, and these are females um, have this uh, lovely green color. Um, the markings on the abdomen. Um, beautiful uh, dragonfly. Here's one perch. These again are perchers, so they like to stay put uh, on uh, and um, are pretty easy to let you get close enough to take some photos of. Um, here's a male. Uh, all these pictures, by the way, were up at Mountain Empire. I've seen them other places as well. They're reasonably common around here. Uh, the male eastern pond hawk has the bluish color, has that kind of the greenish eyes. 
and a little bit of green on the thorax section. Um, saw a mating pair last uh, summer, but uh, they took off before I could get a photo of the uh, wheel they formed. And here is one we talked, I haven't talked about this yet. These perching dragonflies, uh, a lot of them do a process known as obelisking, like an obelisk. They will point their abdomen toward the sun on hot summer days in order to kind of minimize, uh, while you know insects are cold blooded and they need the warmth of the sun and sometimes they don't want too much warmth. And so on a hot sunny day, you'll see these perchers with their abdomen pointing in the direction of the sun and their wings kind of cocked in an odd way as they try to minimize the heat from the sun so they don't overheat. And it's called obelisking, uh, a neat little term I learned about dragonflies recently. And here's a teneral. We talk about a newly emerged dragonfly being teneral. This is an eastern pond hawk female, newly emerged. Look at the sheen on the wings. You can see the wings have not fully dried yet. She did fly a little bit uh, along the ground and then landed there. And I didn't want to startle her or, or scare her too much, but uh, she was still trying to let get her wings dry. Her green, green color hasn't really greened up fully yet compared to the more mature adults uh, that are there. Now there's one dragonfly that is probably the most photogenic of all. Uh, they're the blue dashers. They are not very big but they have a lot of spunk and they almost love to come and pose for pictures and things. This one is obelisking. Uh, it's a male. This is in my garden. Uh, one day we lived just a few blocks from the uh, Powell River. So uh, there is a water source nearby, uh, but he sat there for quite a while. He'd fly off maybe a, a little bit and then come right back and perch there again and just saying, uh, look at me, uh, take your pictures and all. And so, this is one of the easier species to photograph. Uh, here's one that's perched on. You saw almost eyeballing me. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm hot stuff. Notice the abdomen, how gray it is compared to the other one. This is an older male. Uh, the pruinosity is the term for when the abdomen uh, changes color like that, becomes gray. Uh, here's a female uh, blue dasher. She's not as blue, obviously, and she's got red eyes. Um, you know, but she has a similar type of abdomen and she's kind of obelisking to a certain extent with her wings there like that. Uh, here's another female, uh, again, perched with her abdomen pointing toward the sun. Uh, to get a comparison of size, uh, I got a photograph of a blue dasher male alongside a uh, um, blue mud dog or wasp. So if you're familiar with the size of that wasp, which is medium size, is not the largest wasp around, you can get a comparative size of how uh, these are blue dashers are fairly small compared to some of the other dragonflies around. Uh, here's another one obelisking and here's one up on a branch. I thought it was a neat picture to see the uh, patterns in the wings that the dragonflies have. And one more uh, blue dasher. This is a female that I captured in a net uh, and then when I released her she hung on to my uh, uh, finger for a little while and looked at me and so I, well, I'll get a little picture of you. So there's a close up of, of uh, her. She did fly off well uh, later on. So no harm, no foul. Some of the colorful dragonflies that, that I've spotted a couple years ago, we had a lot of these bright red dragonflies. I'm 90% sure these are ruby meadow hawks but I can't be 100% sure unless I would capture one and then examine very carefully the hamules and the uh, external parts uh, to uh, be certain because there are several very similar bright red uh, meadow hawk species uh, that are around. But um, best I can tell the, the, by the location and other things, uh, these are ruby meadow hawks. Beautiful, beautiful uh, colorations on these. Fellas, here's uh, the sun hits them in different ways to uh, light up their abdomens and all. Uh, there's one obelisking uh, in the bright sun. There were a bunch of these up in Mountain Empire two years ago. Last year, I didn't see very many. Again, they may, uh, we talked about the, uh, uh, it may take two to three to four years sometimes for the uh, larvae to become adults. So their offspring, 
may not uh, show up again till maybe this summer or next summer. I don't know. Another picture of them. I love the uh, colors on the uh, uh, metal hawks. Um, pretty common in lots of places are these skimmers. These are slaty skimmers uh, pictured here. Here's a nice male. They're another percher. They seem to perch and then if something comes by, they'll go after it. Maybe they're, they're hoping a female will come by or they're hoping for food to come by. Uh, there's um, another one of those guys. Uh, a female uh, newly emerged, I found up the Mountain Empire Pond. This is a tenoral female. I didn't know what it was. Again, I had to, send, to post this on a Facebook site and an expert uh, ID'd it because I had no idea that I, I could recognize a slaty skimmer, but the female, particularly the tenoral female, where she hadn't taken her true colors yet, uh, was uh, difficult to ID. Uh, there's another picture, again, the, the sheen on the wings and the abdomen tells you she's still trying to draw and she was uh, basically uh, laying in the grass, in a grassy area, uh, trying to dry her wings and, and get ready to uh, fly and hopefully find a boyfriend and a mate in the area. Uh, here's a, a nice colored male. I thought that was a neat picture. The sun was hitting that in an interesting way. A little bit of beating on the wings. You see, uh, as they age, their wings maybe get torn or whatever. But uh, they are very strong flyers as they zip around the uh, pond and all. Um, saw one one day that was battling with a uh, pretty mature uh, Blue Dasher, you get a comparison of the two. They were trading spots. They, they had this one reed that they both seemed to like, and the one would come up and, and take the high spot, and the other one come and land below it, and then they'd fly off, and then they'd trade places and all. They were trying to, I guess, play a little game of King of the Mountain or something. Uh, two species there. They seem to coexist pretty well um, at that point. And here is a mating wheel. It took me about three years of slaty skimmer searching to finally find uh, and, and get a decent picture of the mating process, the male on top clasping the female by the head and her abdomen going up to uh, uh, mate with the uh, male. Uh, some other uh, recent, this is last summer, uh, I've seen pictures of these around, I've seen them around, but finally got a good picture of this, a beautiful skimmer called the 12 spotted skimmer. Uh, love the markings on the wings. Uh, and uh, was able, this was, luckily, uh, it perched within reason. It was, it was still out over the water, but I was able to set up my camera and zoom in and stayed there long enough that I could get a couple of uh, pretty neat shots of this uh, lovely, lovely uh, dragonfly. And the last little set I'm going to do are the meadow hawks. Uh, they are one of the last dragonflies you'll see toward the end of summer called the autumn meadowhawk. And we talk about how the meadowhawks are all bright red and they're hard to tell different ones apart. This one you can ID. They have yellowish, brownish legs. Uh, the other meadowhawks all have black legs, but these autumn meadowhawks, uh, they're pretty small, brightly colored. Uh, I see them in, um, start seeing them in August and see a lot of them in September, even October, as long as it stays reasonably warm. Uh, uh, I've seen these around. There's a, another photo one. They seem to perch and land and, on wood in different places. Um, here is a female. She's not as brightly colored. Uh, she's perched on a reed there. Uh, here is a pair of them. Now they've been ovipositing. They're taking a rest, I think. They've already mated and the male is the bright red one on the right and, and again he's keeping his claspers attached to the female uh, there, and they landed on a rock and, and all. I think they flew off later on and, and were, she was dropping eggs into the uh, water, if I recall. And that particular day, I remember this day greatly because it was the day I was still working at Mountain Empire and we had all these committee meetings and uh, off and on throughout the day, I had about four meetings and in between I had some free time. So every time I got a break from committee, committee meeting, I, I uh, went up to the pond and they were just the autumn meadow hawks all over the place and mating pairs all over the place. And I was able to get some, some nice photos of the wheel. Uh, here's another mating pair. Uh, males almost looking at me. I say, hey, give me some privacy there uh, and all. But uh, those, those are uh, beautiful uh, dragonflies and just fun to watch the uh, 
commotion as they fly around and in the courting behaviors that are going on with them. So that completes my uh, presentation here. I got it in under an hour. We got time for a few questions. Just some uh, information. If you're interested in a good guidebook, I think one of the best ones around is Paulson's book, uh, Dragonflies and Damselflies of the East. Um, it has a wealth of information on it. I'm still learning uh, so many things about it. Uh, Bug Guide, I mentioned when I did my butterfly talk, is a great source for insects in general. And I've found that as I'm trying to learn and uh, more and more about Odonata, some Facebook groups have been helpful. Southeastern Odes, uh, Odonata of the Eastern United States, and probably my favorite right now is the Virginia Odonata. Uh, they have been very helpful. There's some really good people there that if you get a picture, and I'm sure uh, what you found, uh, you can post it, and they are very good at helping beginners learn um, about these uh, amazing uh, insects and all. So I've got my email there again. I welcome any uh, questions or pictures that you might have. And I guess if I can find the, uh, I'll uh, escape from the uh, PowerPoint here. Yeah, see if I can stop share and see if I can find the uh, questions up here. Okay, I got that little thing go up there. Okay, so let's see. Where's the darn questions? Oh, there's the chat. Okay. Okay, so we got the folks that are there. Hello, hello, hello. Um, yeah, yeah, I alluded to the green, um, not the, the um, um, green darner. I think it's not dagger there in the question, but the green darner is in the news. Yeah, they had a huge migration last fall. Uh, it was showing up on radars. Uh, throughout the East Coast. Uh, Cincinnati radar had them, Pittsburgh radar had them. Uh, they're more so than usual. This has been going on for, you know, thousands of years probably, but it's only fairly recently that entomologists realized how massive these, these uh, uh, migrations have been. Uh, they migrate south in huge, huge numbers. Uh, and I had a, a, a big group of them show up in my backyard during that time. And it was fun watching. They seemed to come in and go into feeding frenzy and just fly around uh, an area where there are lots of gnats and, and mosquitoes and other things uh, coming up in the air, probably around uh, four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon, they were showing up and just coming into a spot. And then um, they go off somewhere and, and into the woods or somewhere to find places and trees to, to roost for a while. Then they take off again. But, uh, that was amazing to see all those. I netted a couple of them to make sure they were green darners because there are other species that will sometimes join in on the migration. Uh, then their offspring, they'll go south and along Gulf Coast areas in Florida and other places, maybe even into the, into, uh, the uh, Caribbean area. But then uh, in, the, in the spring, uh, their offspring will start headed back, but not in as large a numbers. I don't think the migrations in the spring are as noticeable. Uh, but they'll be coming through, if not already. I've seen some pictures of people showing some darners that are showing up on uh, eastern uh, Virginia and other places and all. So where do they go? Well, they go uh, south, and, and they're still, I think, trying to track and figure out where all they go there and all. Um, habitat improvement. Well, if you have um, clean water and streams, you're going to have them. They are a good sign that if you have a lot of dragonflies and damselflies, you've got regionally clean water. Uh, uh, so they are kind of a, uh, a species that can, that can be used to uh, let you know that you're doing things right with your water sources and all. Uh, there are certain ones that prefer little ponds. Some of them will, will uh, 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 use streams uh, and areas, um, big lakes or rivers. Uh, I see a lot of those dancers along the Powell River, so that must be a site that they uh, prefer and all. Okay, so uh, do they make it all the way to where they're going? Well, I guess so. I think, I don't know if anybody's been able to track and put a little radio device or something, a neat thing to try to do to get something on, on uh, uh, dragonflies that you could actually track 
you know, where they go. Uh, I know, you know, monarch butterflies, they can put little stickers on the wings and then they can see by uh, how far where those butterflies have, have come if someone happens to capture or find uh, the monarch butterfly and they got the little stickers. I don't know that they're, they've done anything like that with uh, dragonflies yet. That'd be something uh, might be interesting to uh, try sometime. So anyway, that's, um, that's my program nine. I got it in a little bit shorter than my butterfly, which is good. I went too long on the, on the last one. So any other questions? Uh, making yards attracting to them. I'm not sure. They don't nectar. The only thing that they would come in your yard for is if they're hunting prey. Uh, so if you got lots of bugs flying around your yard, uh, then they're going to come in to uh, try to capture those. Of course, uh, they eat a lot of mosquitoes, and you don't want mosquitoes in your yard probably, uh, but they don't nectar on flowers. I'll occasionally see a dragonfly pass through my yard. Uh, they might land for a little while. Uh, but uh, they're not something that you can garden for in the way that you garden for pollinators. Because again, these are predators. Uh, they're going to uh, be feeding on other uh, flying insects for the most part. So I guess if you have flying insects in the yard, they might come by. They could grab a bee, they could grab a butterfly, uh, uh, any kind of thing in the air. Uh, they're predators, by the way, besides birds, could be robber flies. And of course, other species of dragonflies, they, they will uh, feed on, uh, on uh, other species. Uh, and also they've got to be on the alert all the time that something might be flying around to get them. Okay, thank you. I appreciate some of the comments there. So that's all I have. If there are any other questions, uh, appreciate your folks coming in on a uh, Thursday night and joining us. Thank you very much. Great, great information. Thanks so much, Chris. Yeah, well, that was really, really good. Top notch. No, I'm, I'm still learning. I figure I, I worry that an expert's going to come up here and say, no, you ID that one wrong. That's, uh, that's something else. And it, it could be, as again, uh, it's, uh, they are more difficult to ID than, than butterflies, I think. And, um, uh, but uh, it's uh, something I've enjoyed learning about about and want to keep learning about them as I, uh, if I can get out and get some good days to start getting, getting some more pictures. Well, maybe all the wet weather will benefit the uh, cause this year. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Very good. Folks, thanks so much. Chris, thanks so much. Folks, thanks so much for joining us uh, on this Thursday evening. We, I will say that, uh, Shad, Phil, and I sat down this morning for about an hour, and we planned out uh, several more of these sessions with, uh, uh, I think we got a good assortment of stuff coming up in the next few weeks. And there's, there's not one tomorrow night, so don't, uh, correct? Yeah, we, we're skipping some of the Fridays. We may end up putting some on Fridays, but we're going to try to take a break then and and uh, just wanted to let Chris see that uh, Woody said that it was worth putting Frozen on pause for. So uh, it, he has surpassed Disney in his uh, quality of his presentation. So. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. That's Chris, a well, one compliment. Question. Yeah. One quick thing I saw a camera using. I've got a couple different cameras. I've got a Nikon P90 that I found for insects. It's a point and shoot. It's not an SLR but it has a great zoom on it, which I found, and it's quick. Uh, I, you can try to play around with f-stops and focus and all that thing, but, but for insects that are flying around and not staying put very often, uh, you need something that's pretty quick. I found that Nikon with, and it has a pretty good zoom on it, so that's what I'm using uh, to get uh, a lot of these pictures. Awesome, they're great, they are great. Thanks. Folks, I guess we'll see you all Monday evening then. All right, everybody. Have a good time. Good job, Chris. Thank Stay you. Thank you again, Chris. Y'all have a great evening.